for the day, which is the preview of the 2013 term. Before I do, however, uh, I would like to remind everyone here who would like CLE credit to don't forget to sign in at the registration desk as well as pick up your certificate uh, that verifies that you did attend and you did earn these credits. Number one, and number two, we would like your feedback. So we have evaluation forms at the registration desk. Uh, we have a reception after this, good food, good drink. Uh, and so we are going to be walking around asking you, bugging you, to please fill out the evaluation form because we really do want to hear what you think uh, about today. Okay, with that, I am going to briefly introduce uh, our moderator, Professor Carolyn Shapiro of Chicago Kent. Professor Shapiro is an associate professor here, as well as director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States, otherwise known as ISCOTUS. Fantastic uh, organization with great events, and we urge you to check it out. She focuses her scholarship on federal courts and labor and employ employment law. During her career, she has worked on several US Supreme Court cases at both the CERT and the Merit stage. She uh, is a triple threat from University of Chicago. She earned her bachelor's there, her master's there from the uh, Harris Graduate School of Public Policy, as well as her JD. Following law school, she clerked for Ch Chief Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, and then Justice Stephen Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. With that, we'll get started. Thank you, Christy. Um, and I'm going to apologize now to my panelists because I'm going to introduce you very briefly so that we actually have time to talk about our cases um, and refer everyone to the program uh, where there are more detailed bi bios. But to my immediate left is uh, Stephen Loy, a partner at Stoll, Keenan, Ogden, and Ogden in Kentucky, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Um, then we have Paul Wolfson, who's here from Wilmer Hale. Uh, next to him is Jim Dabney from Freed Frank. And finally, on the end, we have Mark Lemley, an esteemed intellectual property professor from Stanford. So thank you all for being here. Um, Jan Conlon, who is supposed to be also on this panel, unfortunately had a client emergency and was not able to come into town today. She sends her regrets. Fortunately, however, uh, Paul turns out to be one of her co-counsel on the case she was going to talk about. So we're going to be well uh, taken care of in that matter. And we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Where we're going to start, we'll talk about the two cases that are, the Supreme Court has already granted cert in. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the cases in which they might grant cert. Um, I will start by saying, as, as Christy mentioned, my expertise is, well, she didn't quite put it this way, but it's not intellectual property. <laughs> and uh, so I was really excited when I discovered that the two cases we're going to talk about first involve standing and um, involve burdens of proof. Right? I get that stuff. So um, I'm going to start with, with you, Stephen. Uh, you have the case of Lexmark International versus Static Control Components. You, rec you represent Lexmark. It's being argued on December 3rd. Your, your first argument. Will be my first argument from the Supreme Court. Um, so then this was the case that has to do with uh, standing. And it's uh, in, in the context of a Lanham Act um, a, a false advertising case. So can you explain in a little more detail what that issue is? Sure. The, the issue that the court accepted cert on is prudential standing requirements for false advertising claims under the Lanham Act. There is a, 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 a near perfect three-way split. Nine circuits have addressed this issue and uh, three circuits uh, adopt an approach that it's a categorical approach. It says <clears throat> only competitors have standing to sue for false advertising. Three circuits have adopted the AGC test that is utilized in antitrust and says that AGC is the test for standing under the Lanham Act. And three circuits adopt what's called the reasonable interest test, which is a, the, more, the most lenient of the three. And the Supreme Court uh, accepted cert to resolve that split. Uh, the trial court, in our case, adopted the AGC test and dismissed the claims of the opposing party, static control. The Sixth Circuit reversed that, saying that they were bound by prior precedent and adopted the reasonable interest approach. And so we find ourselves in front of this, uh, the Supreme Court. Um, a couple of notes. One, this is, if you are interested in IP law, this is a great case for it. It started off as a copyright 
DMCA case, uh, the, the affirmative claims that went to trial, we had a six-week trial in 07, were patent infringement claims. Uh, we have antitrust counterclaims and the Lanham Act uh, counterclaims. To give you a sense of maybe what our particular case is like in view of the split, Lexmark manufactures printers and cartridges. Uh, we don't sell component parts. We sell whole printers, we sell whole cartridges. Our main competitors are HP, Canon, Xerox, other printer manufacturers. But there's an aftermarket that is developed. When a customer exhausts the supply, the toner supply in their cartridge, uh, there are certain companies that will come and get those cartridges and refill them with toner and resell the cartridges. And Lexmark does that its own self with its own cartridges. We have a remanufacturing program. Static Control is not a remanufacturer. What they are is they're a parts supplier to the remanufacturing industry. They supply toners and microchips and things of that nature uh, that allow the remanufacturers to refill our cartridges. So uh, that's why under the categorical test, uh, Lexmark will succeed. Uh, under the antitrust standing test, where competition is a very important factor, uh, we also got the claim dismissed using that test. The reasonable interest test is more um, lenient and uh, we would say without teeth. So, uh, and I, just to, to clarify, the, reasonable, the test, the question here is not Article Three standing. No. The question here is uh, prudential standing under the Lanham Act. And the AGC test that developed in antitrust is sort of a multi-factor test that tries to get at the underlying concerns of the statute. Yeah, the AGC test, um, which was developed three decades ago uh, for antitrust standing um, under the Sherman and Clayton Acts, it looks at five factors. It looks at, is this the type of harm that Congress meant to prevent? And in looking at that factor, they, they consider whether a competitor has filed the lawsuit. Uh, the second factor that they look at is the um, the, the, the directness of the injury uh, to, the, to the defendant's conduct. Uh, they look at the proximity of the defendant to the plaintiff um, and whether there's a better class of plaintiffs to pursue the claim. They look at whether the damages are speculative and they look at whether there's a risk of duplicative damages or problems in apportionment. So, right, so it's, it's, it's a not an entirely predictable test, but it is definitely, it would be much harder a test for your, uh, your opponent to, to meet. Uh, yeah, by virtue of having the, the five factors and the benchmarks, it, it is inherently a more difficult test, and it, and it expressly considers competition as a key component. And, and if you're not a direct competitor, um, then oftentimes there's going to be another class of plaintiffs that are going to be better suited to pursue that. So um, thank you. Um, we're, I want to, since we are very, we have very tight time here. We're going to move on to talk about the Medtronic case, uh, which sure. is being argued on November fifth. Are, are you arguing? Uh, no, I'm not arguing it, but um, uh, but um, uh, I, I do represent Medtronic, and so I'm quite happy to talk about the case. Um, so this is an issue that came to the fore since Metamune. Metamune, as you all will recall. Um, the Federal Circuit had previously held that it had no jurisdiction, that when a licensee continued to pay royalties under the license but wanted to challenge the patent as invalid, that there was no federal jurisdiction over such a suit because the licensee didn't have any kind of reasonable apprehension that it would be sued by the patent holder. The Supreme Court rejected that rule and said, yes, there is uh, Article III jurisdiction in such a situation. So this is a, a metamune type case. Um, uh, the Murawskis are uh, uh, holders of patents to um, a defilibrator and um, a pacemaker, a heart resynchronizer technology um, through a sort of complicated series of licenses that I won't go into. Um, the uh, licenses are held by Medtronic, which of manufactures uh, uh, medical, medical devices of various kinds. The license provides that as Medtronic continues to bring products onto the market, if the Murawskis think that one of that they're one of the new products um, is covered by the patent, the Murawskis can make a demand and say, pay us royalties. If Medtronic disagrees, Medtronic then has the right to 
um, go, go sue under a declaratory judgment action, um, uh, contending, you know, among other things, that the patent is invalid and, uh, you know, not, and also not infringed um, or not, not, or not covered by the patent. So um, Medtronic did this. And the district court um, was presented with the question of, well, in such a case where the lawsuit is initiated, where it's not a patent infringement action initiated by the patent holder, but it is a, de a declaratory judgment action initiated by the licensee who contends that its product is not covered by the patent, who has the burden of proof? And the district court said, well, of course the patentee has the burden of proof because the patentee always has the burden uh, to prove infringement, this is just the mirror image of that. You know, it's just sort of a happenstance that the that the licensee is a plaintiff because it's a declaratory judgment action. We have that sort of situation all the time where people can initiate declaratory judgment actions. It doesn't change anything about the substantive law. So the patentee has to prove um, uh, has to prove that the that the product read on the patent. And um, case went to trial, and um, uh, Medtronic won. Um, so the Murawski's appeal and the Federal Circuit said, no, 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 no. Um, Medtronic brought the declaratory judgment action here. Medtronic is the plaintiff. The plaintiff always has the burden of proof in our system because the plaintiff is the party that is trying to change, change the status quo. So um, Medtronic, you have the burden of proof. Judgment reversed, go back to, go back to the district court judge and figure out who wins. So um, Medtronic um, then filed a cert petition with the Supreme Court and said, you know, this, this is crazy. Um, you'll forgive a little editorial comment. Because I, I didn't <laughs> indicate who you represent. Oh, sorry. But I think, no, I think, I think, I think it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we got it. <laughs> In case you didn't get that before. <laughs> so Medtronic filed a cert petition and said, no, 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 this can't be right. You know, um, the burden of proof on the substantive question <clears throat> cannot depend on the happenstance of who um, initiated the lawsuit because otherwise, why would you ever bring it to declaratory judgment action if the cost of doing that is all of a sudden you have to bear the burden of proof instead of waiting for your opponent to sue you? Um, or else you, of course, see it quite differently. They say, that, you know, you're the one who decided to, you know, to stir the waters by going into court. One of the one of the costs of doing so is that you bear the burden of proof. We were perfectly happy with things that the way they were before. You're the ones who want to kind of get out from under, you know, get out from under the, the license and your legal obligation. So the Supreme Court um, uh, took the case, um, and the parties have filed their principal briefs. Um, uh, we, for Medtronic, are currently in the middle of, of writing our reply brief. There is an interesting issue of federal jurisdiction, which is poked its head up by virtue only of an amicus brief filed by Tessera. Both parties in the case, Medtronic and Murawski, agree that there is federal jurisdiction. There's an issue, but, but an amicus has raised the question about whether there is jurisdiction in the case under the Gunn versus Minton case, which you heard um, uh, about this morning. I won't, we don't have the time for me to, to go into that, but it is a very interesting question, and um, <coughs> I don't know what the court will do with it, because um, uh, whether they'll be interested in it, but um, I think that that's another little sort of facet of the case. That <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I, you I, I actually think it would be interesting, this is a good moment to sort of talk about the question of using a different appellate counsel than trial counsel, because you, you, were, you came in at the appeals. Correct, court. correct. I mean, you know, this actually, fits in very nicely with kind of the themes that Judge Wood was yes. talking about earlier, which is, you know, the Supreme Court is extremely much so generalist court, right? And also, even though the, you know, one interesting thing is, there still, I think, are relatively few federal circuit law clerks who go on to clerk at the Supreme Court, which is, I think, surprising in light of the fact that the court continues to take more and more, you know, federal circuit cases. So there is, you know, when, when writing a cert petition in particular in the Supreme Court, you know, there really is a, you know, significant tension about how to kind of make, you know, how to sort of, especially if it is about kind of a real substantive issue of patent law, which arguably this case is not, but, you know, if it's about, you know, for example, what should the standard be for, you know, inequitable conduct, or what should the standard be for subject matter, you know, patentability, patentability. Um, 
You know, it, it is, I think, very, um, there is kind of always a real tension about, you know, how you have to sort of make the court understand, you know, what the patent issues are, but you are writing for a court that is, you know, really views its, especially with the federal circuit there as kind of the patent experts, really views its role as something different, as kind of setting kind of the general rules of the road. Um, uh, you know, I always find that if I can't figure out by the end of the statement of the facts why the in a, in a certain petition, you know, why the court should take the case, then you have a real problem because if it's too, you know, if you're writing in the federal circuit, the statement of the facts can be kind of pretty technical, and the, the, the federal circuit has kind of, I think, a lot more, you know, patience with understanding like, oh, this is really an issue of claim construction, and I have to pay kind of close attention to you know, all the, what all the words mean, although even then, you know, I have to put your patience is, you know, is tested sometimes. You know, Supreme Court, not so much, right? And um, yes, it is true that the ideal counsel, as Judge Wood was pointing out, would be the person who really understands the technology, but can also, you know, um, be generous. But I think that the, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court really, you really have to kind of understand why is the case important, not just for patent law, but also, for a whole economic sector, you know, for example. I mean, I think at cert, I think in patent law, cert petitions, amicus briefs can be particularly useful in sort of helping helping the court understand, you know, look, we understand that you don't take that many patent cases, there's never gonna be a conflict of the circuits. This is one of the ones you should pick out and pay particular attention to because the issue is really important to the economy or to innovation or you know, or the particular sector or something like that. So, uh, so you're sort of making a, a pitch for some specialization in terms of uh, Supreme Court or appellate. I think it's useful to kind of, I think it's, you know, just as like, I mean, I'm sort of an appellate specialist, but, you know, I certainly would not sort of go into like cross-examining an expert witness without somebody, you know, helping, you know, uh, without somebody who has done that a lot of times. So I think it is useful to kind of at least consult <laughs> you know, people who know that world and who sort of can, you know, can think about it even if you're not sort of bringing on somebody to, you know, to handle your case. But always think about, as always, you know, in any court, you know, think about your particular venue and who your audience is because the different styles of writing are very different depending on the court. I hope Paul is wrong. <laughs> I, didn't say, I didn't say you had to, I didn't say you had to get replacement counsel. I'm sure you, I'm sure you had <laughs> Um, Jim, did you want to add anything? Um, my own personal experience uh, with this question, and I get to ask this question a lot because uh, I have had three cases in which I was counsel for the petitioner at all three phases of the judicial system. So um, uh, I get asked uh, this question whether, uh, whether having uh, your Supreme Court representation uh, handled by a Supreme Court uh, specialist or someone who holds himself out as a, as a Supreme Court specialist is, uh, is a net net positive and there are gentlemen's disagreements about this. Um, my own experience on this is that it's certainly at the cert stage uh, I have learned an enormous amount uh, from Professor John Duffy who was a Supreme Court law clerk and uh, certainly uh, my perception of, of what would make for a powerful cert petition. Uh, has been enormously helped uh, by the interactions I've had with him. Uh, so I do think that there is real value in having an insider's view of what makes for a persuasive argument at the Supreme Court level. I've read Stern and Gressman, and I've worked on, on cert petitions before I met John, but until I worked with the former Supreme Court clerk, I never really had, had I think, the, uh, uh, that insight. I, I, when it comes time to arguing the case, um, I may be misperceiving, but I have detected that I have received some questions from justices in which they don't seem to be trying to make an appoint through me or trying to embarrass me, but they actually genuinely want to find out from me how something would actually play out in practice in the trial courts because they are aware that I'm not one of their coterie of Supreme Court specialists and they're genuinely interested in the answer. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, you know, it has advantages and disadvantages, but uh, uh, I think that you can make a case 
uh, for uh, someone who actually practices in the trial courts regularly um, to be um, uh, an orator in the Supreme Court. And if you want to hear a really, really eloquent demonstration of that, the SCOTUS blog has a long video with Bert Newborn in it, uh, who was uh, a celebrated civil rights professor at uh, NYU, who also is uh, a very, very active uh, litigator. And uh, he, he addresses this question very eloquently. And he says he thinks his teaching is helped from his practice, and his practice is helped from his teaching. Uh, anyone else want to add to this? So what we're going to do now then is move on to talk about some of the cases and issues that are pending before the court or that may, uh, where cert petitions may yet be filed. There's a long list in your materials of uh, cert petitions to watch, and we're certainly not going to hit on every single one of those. Um, but, but each of our, our, some of our different members of our panel will talk about issues and cases that they uh, think are perhaps most likely to be taken up. And, uh, Mark, we could start with you. Sure. Uh, so let me identify several issues kind of in order of how far out they are uh, and heading to the court. The first, which I think is heading to the court uh, imminently, uh, is, uh, is patentable subject matter yet again. Uh, we've had three Supreme Court patentable subject matter decisions in the last three years. There's no question in my mind that the Supreme Court is sick to death of the issue, uh, that they'd like it to go away. Uh, and be settled, uh, but it seems pretty clear that at least on the software side that is not going to happen. The CLS Bank uh, decision earlier this spring in which the Federal Circuit took on banc the fundamental questions of when uh, uh, implementing an abstract idea in a computer uh, made it patent eligible split five to five uh, with no fewer than seven different opinions uh, on this critical issue. Um, both the CLS Bank case, uh, which came out against patentability uh, uh, in the five to five uh, uh, split, ending up favoring the, the district court opinion, um, and uh, the ultra-mercial uh, case, which is, uh, uh, was decided after that time uh, and uh, had a 2-1 decision uh, with a majority written by two of the judges who were in the uh, dissent, or I don't know if you call it a dissent from a 5-5 to -five decision, but not the winning side of the 5-5. to -five. Um, Just to ex explain, right, that when the court's evenly divided, the lower court opinion... Is affirmed, yeah. right. So um, so you've got all, all of and they and they go in the opposite direction. So what, what, uh, what's clearly happened is there are two camps in the federal circuit on the question of patentable subject matter. Uh, and it matters entirely uh, what panel you get. Uh, and the most recent demonstration of that is a case that I argued, Accenture versus Guidewire, um, and uh, in which we won uh, on behalf of my client Guidewire, finding no patentable subject matter. The two judges who ruled for us were in the uh, five judges who ruled on one side in CLS Bank. The judge who ruled against us, Judge Rader, was in the, uh, the other side in CLS Bank. Um, so it's pretty obvious that the Federal Circuit is, is fundamentally split on this issue and they've been unable to resolve and set, come up with a set of rules that all of the judges are willing to live with. Um, both the CLS Bank case and the Ultramercial case have cert petitions uh, filed. Uh, I suspect, though I do not know, that uh, uh, my opponents in the Accenture Guidewire case will be filing uh, as well. Uh, and I strongly suspect that one or more of these cases will be taken by the court, um, not because they want to, uh, but because uh, it's just unseemly uh, to say that the court of appeals that has exclusive jurisdiction over these cases can't figure it out uh, with any mechanism other than which judge is on the panel. So this is a case where you actually sort of do have a split, yeah, uh, even I'm, though there's only one court. And, and not even a split, I mean, you, have, you, have, you have a sort of irreconcilable split, and, and, uh, and it's, um, I think it's, uh, the Federal Circuit has a perception problem at the Supreme Court already, this is not going to help. <laughs> um, I think it may well matter which case goes up. Uh, both because they've come up and they've come out in different directions, one for patentability, not for patentability. But my guess is at the end of the day, they will take a case. Uh, they will not solve the problem. I personally think 101 is an insoluble problem. And the reason both the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court have been throwing themselves at it is that there isn't a clear answer. There will never be a clear answer. But one of the things we will learn from the Supreme Court's opinion, if and when it happens, uh, is that just adding the words in a computer uh, to an otherwise absolute 
abstract idea does not make it patent eligible. And that's something on which the court is currently split. That will have a pretty profound effect on a lot of claims written in the last 15 years uh, that take uh, exactly that form. So that one, I think, is, uh, is both a high likelihood of some of it grant uh, on one of the cases and a pretty, uh, and a pretty proximate one. Uh, three others that we ought to watch down the road. Um, one is the question of deference to district courts in claim construction. This was the subject of a recent Federal Circuit en banc argument. Uh, it's been percolating in the Federal Circuit for 10 years. Uh, we've been close to, to uh, thinking about uh, granting deference to district courts in claim construction. They finally got an en banc grant uh, through an interesting procedural mechanism um, which we can talk about if you like. Uh, and then we went to oral argument, and it's showing signs that it might be a dud, uh, that a bunch of the Federal Circuit judges who had seemed like they would be on board with the idea of changing the rule uh, that claim construction gets no deference and granting deference to the district courts now seem to be having cold feet. Always hard to uh, interpret from argument what a court is going to do. Uh, but I think it's entirely possible that the court either uh, uh, leaves things the way they are or makes at most a very modest change and says, well, only in uh, very unusual circumstances in which uh, what really matters for claim construction is the testimony of expert witnesses in a Markman hearing, will we grant deference? Uh, and if that happens, I think the chance of, uh, of cert grant goes down a bit. Uh, but if we see a fractured court, like we've seen in some of these other major en banc issues, uh, that may be a reason to think the court will, the Supreme Court will take an interest in the case. The other two are, are longer term issues. These are both issues on which I've done some writing and some thinking. These are cases that are not yet at the Federal Circuit, but in which litigants are starting to percolate issues up. Uh, one of them has to do with functional claiming of software. <coughs> um, the uh, way lots of software patent claims are written takes the form uh, a computer programmed to achieve this result. Uh, and those claims are interpreted right now by the Federal Circuit as covering any computer programmed in any way to achieve this result. That's arguably not what the statute requires. It's not what we would allow in any other area of practice. We don't allow uh, the discoverer of a new drug to claim uh, a configuration of atoms uh, configured to, to treat heart disease uh, and say, well, any configuration of atoms, as long as it achieves this result, is fine with me. Um, my guess is that uh, when a challenge to the uh, broad interpretation of those claims actually makes it up to the court, the court's going to be interested in it. They're going to look at it, uh, and uh, if they take the case, if they, if they find an interest in the case, they're going to say, this is not how the claims are supposed to be interpreted under the statute. And under Section 112F of the statute, we've got, a, we've got a set of rules for how you're supposed to interpret the claims, and the Federal Circuit has substituted its own kind of bright line definitional test for the, what the statute actually says. That has not fared well for the Federal Circuit in past uh, circumstances which has happened. Finally, some of you were here in April when I gave a talk about uh, the right to jury trial and patent validity, uh, which turns out, I think, to have uh, uh, less clear provenance than one might have expected from the last 30 years of history. Um, there are a number of things, I think, that are going to start driving the courts to having to parse when exactly there is a right to jury trial and what will it cover. The most significant of which, I think, is the, the growing recognition uh, by, the, by the Supreme Court that many of the important questions of patent validity are questions of law, uh, not questions of fact. Uh, and the increasing practice by some district courts um, with uneven tolerance by the Federal Circuit of dividing those questions out and asking jurors not to opine on the ultimate question, is this patent claim obvious, but instead to uh, tell uh, to answer questions like, what's the, who is the person of ordinary skill in the art? Or what are the differences between this and the prior art? Leaving the ultimate legal question to the judge. Uh, as those cases start to percolate up, I think the Federal Circuit is likely to um, say in the first instance, no, no, there's a right to have juries determine even the ultimate question of obviousness, not the uh, not just the factual underpinning questions, and if they do that, I think the Supreme Court is going to be very interested in that issue, both in part because it's a procedural and not a uh, 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 not just a substantive one. Right. Thank you, um, Jim. You were going to talk about a couple of 
pending cert petitions? Yes. Um, uh, last term, in two cases, the Supreme Court issued what's known as a call for the views of the Solicitor General. And when that happens, uh, the court is, uh, the odds of cert being granted uh, go way up if the Solicitor General answers, yes, I think cert should be granted. Uh, at the very least, it shows that the issues in these cases are extremely important. The first of these is a case that involves the same statute as we heard about in the Lexmark controls, uh, Lexmark case, and, and in fact it involves uh, a, an issue very similar to the issue that is in um, that case. Uh, and it will be interesting in this case uh, to see whether the textualists on the court are consistent. Uh, because in this case, um, the statute which prohibits false advertising concludes with these words, quote, shall be liable in a civil action by any person who believes that he or she is or is likely to be damaged by such act, end of quote. Now, we can talk all about a 30-year-old Supreme Court case about proximate cause and how the court should, should sort of act like a common law uh, judge to import all kinds of jurisprudential restrictions on that, on that text to say that all kinds of plaintiffs like parts suppliers, well, they don't count. There's more appropriate plaintiffs than that. Um, but in this case, if you can imagine this, Coca-Cola marketed a juice beverage that said in big letters, pomegranate blueberry, fruit juice beverage. And it turns out that 99.5% of that beverage was grape juice and apple juice. So Palm Wonderful, that actually sells pomegranate juice, filed suit and said, that's false advertising, and I'm your direct competitor, and I believe that I am likely to be damaged by that deceptive label. And the Ninth Circuit concluded that, well, no, we're not going to allow you to invoke that statute. Why? We're not going to allow you to invoke that statute because there's another statute, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And the FDA didn't have any problem with that label. That label was submitted to the FDA, and they didn't approve it. And the FDCA provides for comprehensive regulation of drug labels. So we are going to say that you're not going to be allowed to invoke this statute, despite its broad text, because if we did, that would undermine the fact that the FDCA does not provide for any private right of action for violations of the FDCA. Only the government can sue for violations of the FDCA. So in order to, to uh, protect and preserve uh, the absence of any private right of action for Federal Food and Drug Act violations, we're going to say that we got to put a judicial gloss on the Lanham Act to say that, well, you're not the right plaintiff to be uh, complaining about this deceptive label. Uh, uh, now, um, that elicited uh, Seth Waxman's representing uh, uh, the plaintiff in that case. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, what the political forces are going to be about uh, whether the, the FDA is going to like or dislike this kind of a case, but uh, I would say there is a reasonably good chance uh, that uh, the court is going to take that case no matter what the, uh, the Solicitor General says. And it will be a very interesting thing to see that when textualism favors the plaintiff, uh, <laughs> what the textualists will do uh, with that. Uh, the other case in which there has been a call for the views of the Solicitor General uh, is a case that grows out of and is distantly related to the phenomenon that Professor Lemley was talking about. And that is the fact that nowadays, uh, for a long time now, um, uh, patents have been issuing for subject matter that is basically human behavior, 
uh, that's dressed up as if it is the operation of a machine or a system or whatever, and therefore it is frequently the case uh, that such patents uh, are uh, recite subject matter in which more than one person uh, performs some of the steps of the process. So you can have a distributed computer technology in which you have a mainframe computer and a client computer and you have some software running over here and you have some software running over here and the process that the patent describes and claims is one that naturally would be performed partly over here and partly over here. And the issue in the Akamai case, in which the, the subcourt has also called for the views of the Solicitor General is, when a patent claims a method, a series of steps, a process, but no one person controls and directs the acts which constitute performance of the process, does that constitute patent infringement under the Patent Act? Uh, and for a period of about five years, the Federal Circuit has said there has to be at least one actor somewhere that controls and is legally responsible for all of the actions that constitute uh, infringement of the patent. And if there is no such actor, uh, then there is no infringement. Uh, and there can't be any induced infringement because you've got to have an act of direct infringement in order for there to be induced infringement. In the Akamai case decided last August, in a, a ruling that has now got a, a CVSG, uh, the court in bank um, adopted a new interpretation of what it means to actively induce infringement and held for the first time that I know of that even though there is no one person who infringed the patent, someone can nevertheless be liable for orchestrating a infringement that consists of the actions of this guy over here and this guy over there. So even though there is no act of direct infringement, there is an act of induced a patent infringement within the meaning of 271B. And that is a subject of considerable interest uh, in, the, in the tech and business method patents arena. And, uh, and that one, I think, uh, there is also a very good chance that the court will take that. Thank you. Um, Paul, you have a Sure. Uh, this, so, uh, excuse me. I think that's on. Yes. So this is another case in which the call, court has called for the views of the Solicitor General, in which the Solicitor General has said, no, don't take the case. Um, and which doesn't always work. Does not always work, right? And there's a little bit of dancing around in this case. It's kind of interesting. And this case involves my favorite technology, the karaoke machine. <laughs> um, so um, First Media has a, uh, obtained a patent to a karaoke technology. Um, while they were, uh, you know, pursuing their patent pro uh, patent application in the patent office, they also um, pursued, um, I think, three other applications on related technology, each of which were rejected based on um, based on sort of based on prior art and 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 with specific references. In none of the the patentee and the lawyer never brought those other specific references to the attention of the patent office when they were uh, pursuing the, uh, the uh, patent application for the karaoke technology that we're talking about, so patent issued. Um, they brought an infringement action against Sony. Sony found out about them and says, what? This is inequitable conduct. What do you, you know, this is crazy. You know, you, you didn't tell the, you know, you didn't tell the patent office about these other rejections <coughs> involving closely related technology. And um, the defense was, well, we knew about the technology and, you know, we didn't really think it had any relevance and, you know, it kind of got lost in the cracks and, you know, we like moved our offices a few times and, you know, we forgot about it. But at any rate, we did not deliberately make a decision to not bring this information to the attention of the patent office. So, you know, pure heart but empty head. Um, so this, um, this is um, uh, before the district court. Um, before the Federal Circuit's decision in Theracense, which I'll be talking about in a minute, um, the district court says, you know, about the patentee and the lawyer says, I don't believe a word that you are saying, <laughs> right? You know, you are, they're like, your explanation is completely not credible. Therefore, I find, this is the key, therefore, I find that you made a deliberate decision to mislead, to, to withhold this information from the patent office because I can't think of any other explanation 
why you did not provide this information to the patent office. Um, uh, rules of the patent is unenforceable on grounds of inequitable conduct. Um, there's uh, first media appeals. Meanwhile, the Federal Circuit comes out with its en banc decision in Therosense, which tightens up the standards for inequitable conduct, you know, quite substantially, and you know, makes clear that there's two different elements. There's intent; it has to be a deliberate intent to mislead the patent office, and then also says, and it has to be material, and it has to be but for materiality. Um, this case comes after, comes to the Federal Circuit after Therosense, and the Federal Circuit says you have not you have not met the standards for intentional intent to uh, deceive the patent office under their sense. It doesn't do something that it might have done, which is uh, say, look, the district court was ruling under before pre-Therosense law. We're going to send it back to the district court and for the district court to take another look at it. Instead, what the federal circuit said was, we, you know, the district court did not apply the correct legal standards. We ourselves are going to apply the Therosense legal standards, and we conclude that under Therosense, the district court could not have reached a, con a conclusion of, of inequitable conduct on this record. District court's reversed. So, um, um, so Sony uh, then files a cert petition and says, you know, no, 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 this is, you know, what the federal circuit did was wrong here. And the Supreme Court um, in asked the Solicitor General to um, provide his views to the court. Principally, the cert petition is principally about whether the federal circuit, they, the, Sony does not really take issue with anything having to do with the way that the, that the federal circuit has articulated the standard for inequitable conduct in their sense, but more the argument is that they kind of, the, by the, the, that the, they recognize that it was necessary for the federal circuit to tighten up the standards, but what they say is here they really have made it kind of impossible you know, to, to meet that standard. So the Solicitor General filed a very interesting uh, brief in response to the invitation, which they said, well, we don't really have any problem with Therosense as a legal standard, and we agree with the need to sort of tighten up the inequitable conduct, um, inequitable conduct standard. On the other hand, we do think that maybe the Federal Circuit was wrong in reaching its, its, both in actually making the decision in this case, not sending it back to the district court, and in actually the conclusion that it reached. Because after all, you can sometimes rule that somebody is lying based on the fact that what they say their reason was is you know, completely not credible. Um, and so they're, they're worried that the Federal Circuit has sort of gone too far in saying that just sort of the absence of a credible reason for what you're doing does not mean that, you're re that, you have, that your reason was incredible. But they said, you know, we're not, but the Solicitor General said, you know, we're not really sure that the time is right now to review this. There haven't been a lot of cases after Therosense. We think that there ought to be more cases kind of to percolate in the Federal Circuit to see exactly how Therosense is going to be worked out in practice. I think this is probably the kiss of death to the cert petition. You know, it seems like the, the the Solicitor General is saying, you know, there might be a problem here. We're not sure. We'd like the, we think it makes more sense for the Federal Circuit to spend more time working out. I think it's probably going to be persuasive to the court and just say, you know, we'll just let this one go and we'll wait to see if there's another, another case coming along. Because um, the Supreme Court, of course, is not a court of error correction. Correct, correct. And I was actually a little surprised that the Solicitor General was asked to um, file a brief in this case, which, you know, was interesting to me because it, you know, it, obviously the court was aware of what the, the Supreme Court was aware of what the Federal Circuit had done in Therosense, which is not this case, but they clearly were wondering whether, you know, Therosense had struck the right balance. And I think what the Solicitor General has really said to the Supreme Court is, lots of interesting issues here, but we're just not sure that this is either the right time or the right case to address them. Great. Um, did, before I, we open up for Q&A, does anybody want to jump in or add anything? Well, there is uh, one case. There are two cases. One has uh, had a petition filed. The other will certainly have a petition filed that uh, I think uh, have a very good chance of going up. Um, the one that was recently filed is a case called Arthrex versus Smith and Nephew. Uh, Arthrex versus Smith and Nephew is a case which raises the question whether 
a person who holds a belief that a patent is invalid can on that basis avoid liability for conduct that turns out to have induced infringement of a patent. This is a case in which the defendant had supplied suture anchors, which after three trials uh, and multiple appeals were turned, uh, were held finally by the Federal Circuit uh, to have embodied the patented invention and resulted in a, in a judgment of liability for about $80 million in damages. And the argument was, well, the district judge agreed with us. The district judge granted judgment as a matter of law, and obviously we had good faith grounds for believing that we were not infringing the Smith and Nephew patent, and that should provide us with a uh, with a defense. It's sort of like a, it's sort of the flip side of the inequitable conduct. Uh, and and what this is an outgrowth of is uh, is a case that the Supreme Court decided in 2011 called Global Tech, uh, which was uh, a case in which uh, the issue the issue in question in that case was whether or not ignorance of the existence of a patent was a defense. Uh, and the court held, affirming a judgment of the Federal Circuit, uh, that held that, um, uh, well, um, the defendant in that case was willfully blind to the existence of the patent. This was a, this was a defendant who, uh, who deliberately averted his eyes from knowing. So if his argument was, I couldn't be liable because I didn't know there was a patent that excluded the sales that I was causing to happen, uh, willful blindness was a sufficient on the issue of whether you knew of the patent. And so what's happened in the two years since Global Tech is that people have been arguing that the concept of willful blindness should be extended to questions, well, did you know not just that the patent existed, but that what you were doing was infringement, which is the Arthrex case. Did you have a good faith basis for thinking that the patent was invalid and therefore you didn't think you were inducing infringement? That is the Camille case that was decided in June, and that is also, I'd say, almost certainly going to be the subject of a petition for cert uh, in the Supreme Court. So uh, the, the scope of 271B, uh, which is also the issue in the Akamon case I mentioned earlier, is in, in deep, deep instability. Right uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd put my money on Comil and not Arthrex. I think Arthrex presents an issue did you know it was infringing, that the Supreme Court pretty clearly, albeit in dicta, resolved uh, in SEB. Uh, the invalid, the, did you think the patent was invalid, even though you know you're infringing, is not one they've resolved. Let me, let me close with one final um, uh, case uh, where there are petitions pending that I do not think will be granted, but the issue they identify will eventually be granted, and that is attorney's fee shifting for prevailing defendants. Um, the Federal Circuit has been systematically dismantling the discretion of district courts to give fees to defendants when they win their cases uh, by basically by limiting it to cases of inequitable conduct and then in turn limiting inequitable conduct to, to the vanishing point. Um, the, the identical statute in the trademark law, by contrast, is uh, uh, interpreted much more capaciously. Um, I think there is a good cert petition that will be written that will catch the court's attention uh, on this issue and will result in more discretion and more case-by-case -case ability to grant fees. There are two petitions up there now, uh, but they, they suffer from some factual difficulties. In both of those cases, the district court denied fees, uh, so the discretion issue isn't presented. So I'm not sure that issue is coming right now, but it's coming. Um, we've, I've gotten the stop sign. Um, and since everybody's waiting to go eat and drink, um, I don't want to hold us too far over, but I do just want to give a chance for maybe one or two questions, if there are any. All right. Oh, yes. The assolidly ambiguous issue. Yeah, yeah indefiniteness, yeah. right. You did mention yep. this idea that Press the button. to be insolubly ambiguous in order not to be indefinite. Right. I agree with that. So I, you know, I, it's an interesting question. There were a, there was a petition a couple years ago that presented this issue. The Federal Circuit's definition of whether a patent is indefinite, unless it is a software means plus function claim element, is basically no. It's never indefinite uh, a, a, unless it is insolubly ambiguous. It doesn't matter that it's going to take teams of experts millions of uh, dollars to figure out what it means uh, over a period of years. It's still considered definite. 
I think the issue there is can you get the court interested in the issue? Um, if they take the case and you go back and read Supreme Court precedent, the Supreme Court's precedent on, on definiteness and claiming uh, is a lot different than the Federal Circuit standard, and that standard will not survive. Uh, so the only question is whether they view the case that, that actually is presented as too esoteric. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you all, thank you all for coming to the conference.